This is Sam Saxon. He was arrested in Los Angeles on a drunk charge in 1956 for suspected robbery in 1957 for parading without a permit in Dade County in 1961. This is Alvin or Elvin Franklin Dean. He was arrested in Knoxville, Tennessee in 1958 for molesting women and in Dade County in 1960 for drunk driving. This is Troy Cade on the left. He was arrested in San Francisco in 1952 and 1953 and in Flint, Michigan in 1958 on charges ranging from vagrancy to breach of peace. Cade was convicted in Monroe, Louisiana in 1961 of criminal anarchy and flag desecration. The conviction was later reversed. This is Henry Dawson on the right, convicted in New York Federal Court in 1954 of selective service violation and placed on probation. All are black Muslims. All live in the Miami area. All preach the end of the United States for the white man. And the FBI says the movement is a potential threat to the internal security of the United States. WCKT News and Public Affairs presents Fear of the Secret Dark, tonight on Richard Whitcomb Reports. An investigation of the black Muslim movement and its impact on South Florida. Your reporter, Richard Whitcomb. Good evening. The men we showed you at the opening of the program are leaders of a militant, highly secret organization in the Miami area. They are black Muslims, a national religious cult that says it will take over the United States and eventually the world. In the September 19th issue of Mohammed Speaks, the official black Muslim newspaper seen by few whites and relatively few Negroes, the black Muslims headlined that the destruction and fall of the U.S. was at hand. If there is some dispute about the Muslim takeover of the United States in the foreseeable future, there is full agreement that the Muslims in Miami and elsewhere are a hard-driving, tightly-knit, highly disciplined group trying to take as many people as possible into their fold and billfold. The Muslim rank and file is a low-income group. They give an inordinate amount of their wages to the movement, some because they are dedicated many because they are intimidated. But few can afford the weekly dues of $14.75 or the weekly donation of a day's pay to the Muslim cause. It takes food from the mouths of their children. The money goes to Muslim headquarters in Chicago. None of it is returned to the South Florida Negro community. Muslim leaders, however, live well. The head of the movement, Elijah Mohammed, with homes in Chicago and Phoenix, is reported to be a multi-millionaire. Miami minister Henry Dawson is given a $17,000 home in Carroll City, a $3,000 car, and a $2,000 a year expense account, plus being paid about $150 a week. South Florida's Muslim leaders are responsible directly to Muslim headquarters in Chicago, where the Honorable Elijah Mohammed, a frail man of 72, runs the organization with an iron fist. His word is law in 47 Muslim mosques in major cities across the United States, including Miami. Elijah Mohammed was born Elijah Poole, one of 13 children of former Georgia slaves. In 1930, as the Muslim gospel has it, he met a man named W. Fard Mohammed in Detroit, the mysterious W. Fard Mohammed supposedly came from Mecca, the birthplace of the Muslim prophet Mohammed, and was the incarnation of Allah or God. W. Fard Mohammed mysteriously disappeared in 1934. While the finger of suspicion was pointed at Elijah Mohammed, he nevertheless took over the black Muslim, uh, black Muslim religion of Islam. But whereas Orthodox Muslims preach universal peace and the brotherhood of man and welcome worshipers of all races, the unorthodox black Muslims preach race hatred. The black Muslims contend that the Negro is what they call the original man and that the white man was created from this tribe of Shabazz by an evil Negro scientist named Yaqub. Now, say the black Muslims, after thousands of years of being pushed around by the wicked white man or blue-eyed devil, the benevolent blacks will finally prevail. According to the Muslims, the apocalyptic war of Armageddon is at hand. 
It will be waged in the wilderness of North America between whites and blacks. A giant wheel or mothership operated by the black Muslims will rain nuclear destruction on the whites from overhead, first having spirited away all true black believers safely into the sky. When the Holocaust is over, the wheel will redeposit all blacks on terra firma, and the Muslims, naturally, and their followers will inherit the earth. Under Elijah Muhammad's leadership, the black Muslims emerged as a force after World War II. Today, the organization claims as many as a million members in the United States. Actually, it has only an estimated 7,000 hardcore members nationally. Muslim information is as carefully concealed as that of the John Birch Society. Other thousands of Muslims come and go, many unable to take the tough discipline and expense of membership in the organization. You are seeing local Muslims entering the Miami Mosque located at Northwest 7th Avenue and 53rd Street. Authorities warn that the Muslims are the largest black extremist organization in the United States, and in spite of only 75 hardcore members, it is the most powerful organized Negro group in the Miami area a group that thrives on hard militancy. In fiery rhetoric as disseminated by Elijah Muhammad in his newspapers, in books, on nationwide radio, and until recently over WFAB in Miami, and via records, all financed, produced, and marketed by the Muslims. As well as in personal appearances, the Muslims preach not only the imminent doom of the white liars and murderers, but also advocate a separate state for blacks within the United States or Africa. The Muslims also direct the black man to get rid of his white man's slave name and substitute an X for his last name. The X stands for an unknown quality or quantity. The Muslims, paradoxically, insist they are a peaceful organization. However, they do have a quasi-military unit consisting of the most able-bodied men in the movement. It is known as the fruit of Islam. The Muslims consider themselves the fruit or product of American slavery, a fruit that contains the seed of the future black nation. The Muslims say that this elite secret army is to be used for defensive and not offensive purposes. These are scenes of the fruit of Islam guarding Elijah Muhammad at a 1964 Chicago gathering, celebrating the February 26th birthday of Master W. Fard Muhammad. In Miami, the military unit meets every Sunday morning, the national meeting time at Muslim Mosque number 29. Here at 5325 Northwest 7th Avenue, it undergoes intensive military training including firearms drill, assertedly without actual weapons, judo, and karate. This film was made with a camera concealed in a truck with a one-way mirror, not to be dramatic, but because Muslims have an extraordinary antipathy to being photographed. The Muslims, in fact, are a clannish, super-secret organization. They bar whites from their meetings. At their Miami gatherings, two guards man the gates, and all those attending, including children, are carefully searched for weapons, as well as cameras and tape recorders. General meetings are held regularly on Wednesday and Friday at 8 p.m. and on Sunday at 2 p.m. This is film of such a Sunday meeting. In addition, there is a woman's meeting on Saturday at 9 a.m. Attending Muslim women wear long flowing robes and in this male-oriented religion are trained to be good and obedient housewives and mothers. At Muslim meetings, readings are held from the Quran, the black Muslim Bible, and the need for segregation is stressed. Some segregationists, such as Senator Richard Russell of Georgia, have endorsed the Muslim philosophy of separatism of the races. The Muslims, however, were labeled black racists by the late Martin Luther King. 
But a University of Miami sociologist says black Muslimism is simply a response to white nationalism. Dr. Murray Binderman. Seems to me that a government panel uh, of very widely respected authorities have said that we have, we are living in a racist society. By that, they meant that whites are innately racist. By innately, I mean it is part of our culture. We accept things in terms of uh, considering blacks as inferiors. We accept this as almost a, a uh, uh, part of the culture. Just by being born here, we get some of these things. We learn some of these things from our parents, from our society. And uh, to say that the blacks are racist, you know, uh, why not focus on the whites and say the whites are racist? Uh, in fact, the question would be, would there ever have been a need for an organization or a religion such as the Muslims if it hadn't been the uh, living under the conditions in the white society in America? Would blacks have needed an organization like this? It fulfills certain purposes, obviously, in the black community, uh, certain needs for a people, for an oppressed people. And uh, there, thereby hangs the tale. Do we call the black organization racist or the white which caused it racist? The Muslims recruit members off the street and from jails, clean them up and make them toe the line. Muslims are not allowed to drink, smoke, take dope or philander. They work hard, all for the Muslim movement. They eat one meal a day and sometimes less. Among the right foods for Muslims are most vegetables and fruit. Among the wrong foods are cornbread, fried and starchy dishes, pastries, and the hog, which is regarded as poison food. The theory seems to be that if a Muslim does not spend his money on food or alcohol, he will contribute that much more to the Muslim cause. To join the Muslims, a prospective member must send a meticulously worded and written letter of application addressed to the late Master W. Fard Mohammed in Chicago. The letter begins, Dear Savior Allah and our Deliverer, who came in the person of Master Fard Mohammed, to whom praises are due forever. After declaring his belief in the religion of Islam as taught by Elijah Mohammed, the candidate requests the name from his servant and apostle and then signs his slave name as given him in this wicked white man's world. Muslims who have the money are encouraged to become black capitalists. Last year, the, inv the Muslims invested about $6 million in business and real estate, mostly in Chicago. The Muslims operate 47 schools of their own in the United States, including the University of Islam in Chicago. Although Muslims preach, build black, buy black, they do not hesitate to hire expert white help to operate their business when necessary. Recently, in the Miami area, Muslims have started a number of fairly thriving businesses. There is a boutique, the House of the Seven Seas, owned by Albert Abrams. A gift shop, Black and Gold, owned by two persons known only as brothers Thomas and James A. A fish and poultry market, Fish and Chick, operated by Prince Williams, Benny Gibbons, and Robert Owens. A restaurant, The Orient, in Opalaka, that serves the pork-free Muslim diet. One of the more popular staples is bean pie. It is owned by Bernard Smith. And the Muslim-owned Salam Apartments at 1816 Northwest 46th Street in Miami is occupied exclusively by Muslims and is managed by Benny Gibbons. Tom Washington, although not a Muslim himself, runs a successful dry cleaning plant in Northwest Miami that caters to some 50 well-groomed Muslims. Well, the accomplishments that I can observe as an individual is that they have helped people who could not help themselves. For example, fellows that have lost all desire to accomplish anything positive in life, they have gathered those type of individuals into their organization. 
and they have actually made gentlemen out of them. How important are the Muslims in the Miami area? Well, I would say that they serve their purpose of being very important in the Miami area, but a simple reason is that the way that they dress, they conduct themselves, and the goals in life that they're trying to achieve. I would say that the future of the Muslims, not only here in Miami, but throughout America, will continue to go on a positive scale because they're looking at this program from the beginning to the end. In other words, the Muslims produce from the earth. They're buying farms, they have grocery stores, they're gonna have trucks, department stores, and et cetera. In other words, they're trying to put themselves in a position whereby they will not have to go to the white community to purchase anything. One of the big Muslim businesses is the weekly newspaper, Mohammed Speaks, which claims a national circulation of about 400,000. It is aggressively sold in Miami, with some 5,000 copies circulated weekly. Each Muslim foot soldier, as the newspaper sellers are called within the movement, has to sell a quota of papers ranging from 150 to 300. He pays 16 cents a copy in advance for the 20 cent newspaper, and this is not refundable. These scenes of foot soldiers selling the newspaper at Northwest 54th Street and 7th Avenue were also made with a concealed camera because the subjects had been alerted to evade our reporters and cameramen. The paper carries ads for workers to start Muslim businesses. It also advertises Muslim products like flags, sweatshirts, black power fists, and all black wristwatches with Arabic numerals. Such items are widely marketed and are a big source of Muslim revenue, an estimated $2 million a year. The paper also disseminates the Muslim philosophy, including its professed nonviolence. In 1942, Elijah Mohammed was sentenced to four years in prison for refusing to register for the draft as a conscientious objector on religious grounds. Recently, three Muslims have been indicted and tried in Miami for failing to register. One of these is Philip Washington, seen here on the right, outside federal court, with his court-appointed attorney, Daniel Pearson. Washington's trial resulted in a hung jury, and he will be retried. Another is Robert Owens, who was convicted by a jury. A third Muslim, Peter William Saunders on the right, was convicted in a non-jury trial, and a fourth Muslim, Robert Lee Sears, second from the left, received a 30-month sentence for refusal to be inducted. It is now being appealed. The black Muslims do not advise their members to avoid registering, but tell them to search their individual consciences. This leaves the movement free of violation of federal law. A prominent Muslim involved in a draft-dodging case is heavyweight champion Cassius Clay, or Muhammad Ali. Clay was suspended from the Muslims by Elijah Muhammad for saying that he would go back to boxing one day for the money. He expounded on the subject of nonviolence with WCKT newsman George Skinner. I've been a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for the past, I would say, um, nine years. I have not yet to see a Muslim or a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad come in any type of physical conflict with a white. There's been occasions where we've been attacked by religious centers and the government or the FBI, the police admitted that they were wrong uh, coming in on false charges. But uh, I've never noticed uh, no violence or nothing where you could say that Muslims are physically or radically opposed to whites. As a matter of fact, the religion of Islam uh, means peace. Our very greetings is I salam alaikum, which means may peace be unto you. But uh, I would say Muslims are the most peaceful black people here in America. But we will defend ourselves if attacked, but we are not the aggressors. 
There is an undeniable aura of violence about the Muslims. In the early 30s, W. Fard Mohammed was arrested because of the sacrificial killing of a fellow Muslim. At past Muslim meetings, there have been demonstrations in stabbing, strangling, and choking dogs. On September 9th of this year, George Young, 19, a Jacksonville, Florida Muslim, was sentenced to life imprisonment for murdering two whites and a Negro. Young expressed remorse only for the widow of his black victim. Also on September 9th, Jackie Robinson, a Miami Negro, said he was inspired by a Muslim newspaper to go out and shoot the first white man he saw. He wounded a white truck driver with a 22 caliber revolver. In 1965, Malcolm X, the former number two man in the organization who had broken away from the Muslims to start his own black nationalist movement, was shot to death in Harlem. Three black Muslims were found guilty of the crime. For a supposedly peaceful organization, the Muslims instill fear and intimidation in both white and Negro. As a result, there is an almost total blackout of information about the group. When WCKT newsmen tried to talk to local Muslims, they were referred to their local minister, Henry Dawson, on the right. Dawson, in turn, referred them to the Muslims' national secretary, John Ali, in Chicago. Ali referred us to Elijah Muhammad himself. Elijah Muhammad told us that the Muslims are not talking now. Even people outside the organization shy from talking about the Muslims. City Commissioner Athelie Range, who was involved in the eviction of the Muslims from one of their meeting places several years ago, refused to be interviewed. Willard Fair, head of the Miami Urban League, although not a Muslim himself, said that he felt he could not expound on the Muslims since the local mosque was opposed to any publicity about the movement. Fair said that he did not want to create dissension in the Negro community by talking. Among those who would comment was the leader of the Church of God in Christ and head of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in Miami, Reverend Jacob Cohen. I feel that the Muslims at this point are increasing in membership and we feel that by reason of what has happened in the past that this group is a very important element within the community. And by working with the entire community, I feel that they can be even of greater service. Does the Muslim policy of secrecy and exclusion benefit their cause? Yes, I think it may be a tactful way of doing because if an individual does not know what you are planning, and then you have a better chance of accomplishing your goal. The Muslims meet out harsh discipline to wayward members. Troy Cade on the left, a former Miami minister, was expelled from the organization in December of last year. He would not discuss the matter with WCKT News. Cade now works in the kitchen of the Hebrew Home for the Aged in Miami Beach. Ironically, the Muslims, aside from being racist, are anti-Semitic, although they do have a taste for kosher food. Another highly placed lieutenant in the Miami movement, James Carr, also wouldn't talk. He was expelled by the Muslims several years ago. But ex-Muslims are never really free of ties with the organization. The movement either intimidates them or they hope to rejoin the group. Muslim statistics can be misleading. The dedicated hardcore is small. The fringe support is large. The hardcore, through its military training, its criminal infiltration, and its dedicated militancy, is more dynamic and dangerous than its numbers indicate. In addition to the Miami Mosque, the Muslims in this area have a group of about 15 hardcore members in Fort Lauderdale who meet on a regular basis at 670 Northwest 22nd Road. The Muslims purchased their present Miami mosque, the former 7th Avenue Church of Christ, in September 1967 for $135,000. In 1965, they moved to 4507 Northwest 17th Avenue, which is now a barbecue restaurant. 
In 1966, they moved to 1711 Northwest 57th Street. But they had to move again when neighbors complained about congested parking. One of the complainants was the pastor of St. Luke Baptist Church, Reverend P.W. Williams. There has been a fear in the Negro community of the Muslims because at that time, we just couldn't get anyone to help us to handle the situation. It was their doctor's wife, Dr. J.K. Johnson's wife, and another lady and myself, the only three of us who were brave enough to uh, do anything about uh, what was happening down there. Everybody else was afraid. At the time you were involved in the neighborhood zoning problem with the black Muslims, you referred to them as the Ku Klux Klan of our color. Would you care to comment on that remark now? Well, I think I did make that statement. Uh, I said we didn't need any white Ku Klux Klans and we didn't need any uh, colored Ku Klux Klans and that I style the Muslims as the Ku Klux Klans of the Negro race. And my reason for saying that was of their separatist uh, attitude and their attitude of hatred. They just didn't like the white man. So what we, did we have to gain by hating? Uh, this was what we had, we had always suffered and felt in the Southland from the Ku Klux Klan, hatred. And uh, how could I, as a minister of the gospel, go along with that sort of a thing? I just couldn't do it. I think you're supposed to love your neighbor and love your enemy as well. Most of the Muslim converts are among the young, who are inoculated with a hatred for whites. Here lies the potential threat of the movement. Under Elijah Muhammad's leadership, the Muslims do not participate in civil rights demonstrations. Authorities believe Elijah wants to build up the Muslim power before he strikes. But Elijah Muhammad is a sick old man. He suffers from asthma and spends much of his time in his mansion in Phoenix, Arizona. Although some Muslims believe that Elijah is immortal, when he does die, a younger and more militant man, perhaps someone like black power nationalist Robert Franklin Williams, could take over the movement and touch off a latent explosion. If white society's transgressions against the black man are undeniable, the Muslims, unfortunately, do not offer a solution. Their only significant accomplishment is the separation of the uninformed, the poor Negro, from his money. The Muslims do not help him secure better schools, jobs, or housing. Nor will the promise by Elijah Muhammad of a war of Armageddon help the Negro in the daily war of economic survival. What is disquieting about the Muslims is their monolithic secrecy, their messianic militancy, and their avowed racist philosophy. Negro author Louis Lomax wrote, the black Muslims will endure, but they will not prevail. They make us continually aware of what can happen if white men don't learn to love before black men learn to hate. But it was Dr. Martin Luther King who warned that a doctrine of black supremacy is as great a danger as one of white supremacy. Unless men and nations live together, they will perish together. Richard Whitcomb, WCKT News. You have been watching Fear of the Secret Dark on Richard Whitcomb Reports, a production of WCKT News and Public Affairs. Your comments are invited. This program was recorded.